Hi, meteorology. Well, here's another video, and actually, this is one of the more necessary ones we're going to have. The book does a great job of explaining things, but in my experience, the stuff we're talking about today kind of needs a little extra help. Some of the concepts, they're, they're not mind-boggling, but they're just a little subtle, and you just got to listen closely. So, uh, we are now moving on to Chapter 6. Uh, I believe you should... Turning, yeah, should have turned in your chapter five homework by Thursday, which is when you're seeing this. Video. So, in any case, um, chapter six is basically about air pressure and winds. This is really getting to the heart of meteorology. I mean, the wind, you know, why does the wind blow? What a great meteorology question, right? Okay, first of all, we need to learn about air pressure. And we kind of talked about it already, you know, why the air exerts pressure. It's little molecules that are around. They hit you and bounce off of you and impart some momentum, you know, to you, whatever. Uh, they push on you. Of course they do. And the deeper down under the air you are, the more air you got piling on top of you and the more under pressure, do, 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 do. Uh, the more under pressure you are. Um, so you got that. We already learned that in chapter one. But now what we're going to learn about is, first of all, uh, some specifics like, how do we measure pressure? What are the units we use for pressure? Let's get into that right now. First of all, how would you measure air pressure? Well, you measure air pressure with a thing called a barometer. And the classic kind of barometer, hmm, let, me, let me bring it up this way. Ever use a straw? I'm not using a straw right now, but I have. And how do you make it work? Well, you lower the pressure in your mouth and you allow the external air pressure to push the drink up into your mouth. That's kind of how it works. And also, you know, when you, um, oh, when you use a straw, you can put your finger over the end, hold up, and lo and behold, it doesn't pour out because the air pressure on the outside is pushing up on it and holding it up in the straw. And you're just not pushing it down. You're just sealing off and preventing air pressure on top. From you take your finger away, and water all goes out because the air pressure on top and bottom canceled out, and the weight of the water, you know, took it down. So in any case, uh, one kind of barometer is kind of like a glorified straw. Now the thing is, a straw can only hold as much water as the atmosphere can push up in there. And there's a limit. Turns out that. The entire depth of the atmosphere, if you have a column, say, this, this big around, all the way to the top of the atmosphere, up to space, we don't have a fixed top, but you know what I mean, um, that weighs as much as just about 33 feet of water. That means you can't drink water out of a straw more than 33 feet long. Not that you ever tried. I've tried to drink water out of a one meter long straw sucked on it as hard as I could. I couldn't get it up. What kind of straw? It was a meter stick. It was actually a square cross section meter stick. I was unable to do that. Tried as hard as I could. A student tried and succeeded and had to spit water out of his mouth. But anyway, um, you can't make a complete vacuum in your mouth. But, but there's a limit to how much you could hold up. Now, one kind of barometer is where you could just take water and have this big, huge straw and a reservoir down here with more water in it and the water could only be held up to a certain height above the surface of that, and that'd be a, a way to measure the air pressure. Well, the water would be 33 feet tall, and that's a really tall barometer. Um, so they use a different liquid, mercury. Mercury's really dense, about 13, 14 times as dense as water, and then it only piles up about 30 inches deep instead of uh, 33 feet. One kind of barometer, then, is a mercury barometer. We don't think we have one at the school because they don't like people messing with mercury because you bust it and it's kind of toxic stuff. So uh, that's that's one type though. And so one way to measure air pressure is in inches of mercury. The higher the pressure, the more the mercury gets pushed up to a higher level and you just measure how tall the column is. And average air pressure it, at sea level, because you know you go up above sea level, there's less air on top of you, it's less pressure. So it'd be 29.92 inches of mercury. Um, so, <laughs> on the bowl, yeah. 
Uh, now, you also can measure that in millimeters. It's about 760 millimeters of mercury. But there's another unit we can use. We can use um, pascals, which is newtons per square meter. And the air pressure at sea level, again, averages 101,325 pascals or newtons per square meter. But that's, that's a big number. People don't like to write big numbers or talk about big numbers. So they move it over a couple decimal points and call it either a hectopascal or a millibar. I'll call them millibars. We do that more in this country. So 1,013.25 millibars. So that's some pressure units we use. You can always use pounds per square inch. Pounds per square inch, it's about 14.7 PSI, pounds per square inch. Um, but it doesn't always stay the same. It varies. That's why we bother to measure it. It's not always the same. What makes it vary? Uh, kind of lots of things, but the biggest thing that causes differences in air pressure between different places is temperature differences between one place and another. And that's the part that's kind of complicated to explain and we're going to get to in just a few minutes. Uh, meanwhile, um, there's other kind of barometers. There's barometer, aneroid barometers, really just like a can with a vacuum in it, if that makes any sense. And the, the can depresses or whatever, hooked up to some fancy little gizmo with a, you know, spring-loaded little dial thing. That's mechanical ones. They got electronic ones of various kinds. So there's a lot of technologically different ways to measure air pressure. Um, and this is just average air pressure at sea level, but you know, it varies. How much does it vary? Your book talks about this. They give you examples, but I'll tell you that the lowest I've ever seen it in my life here in Atlanta is about 29 inches of mercury. The average is 29.92. That was during the storm of the century back in uh, 1993. That, yeah, that century. <laughs> Um, but uh, we'll see what this entry brings. Uh, and then um, the highest I've ever seen is about 30.8 inches of mercury. World records range from about like 26 inches of mercury in some super duper hurricane or typhoon up to about 32 inches of mercury. So notice something. Notice that the average of about 30 is closer to the highest pressure ever than it is to the lowest pressure ever. Low pressure systems or areas are more intense in terms of like being further from average. In other words, the average is up here and sometimes it goes way below the average, but it never gets a whole lot above the average. There's good reasons for that that we will be talking about. In any case, another thing you might have noticed, um, these are the storms. These are the thing, you know, the low pressure is the... Um, rain and the wind and the hurricanes and all that kind of stuff. High pressure is usually clear weather. Not quite always, but usually. And there's reasons for that too. So now um, we've established a little bit about what kind of barometric pressures you're gonna find. I want to introduce the idea of weather maps with pressures written on them. Um, you know, you can have your United States here. I won't draw my best here, but that's not my best. Um, you could have like high pressure here and low pressure here. They actually put H's and L's, you know, on maps. Um, and they draw these things that are familiar looking. They're called isobars. They are lines of equal pressure. We learned before about isotherms where you indicate the temperature with these lines. So these are lines of equal pressure. They might do them in uh, millibars, for example. And maybe this is 1,020 millibars, and this is 1,016, and this is 1,012, and 1,008. And ooh, this low pressure is at least as low as 1,004 millibars. And that's a weather map. Millibars on it, lines of equal pressure. Another point I need to make is that these pressures are reduced to sea level. You see, Pressure is going to naturally vary with elevation anyway. If you live up on a mountain, of course the pressure is lower. Everybody knows it will be. And if I actually showed the real pressure at the surface, this would go from being a map of weather conditions to being like a topographic map of elevations. That's not what I need to equalize that. So they have these fancy little things that go through procedures for changing um actual measured pressure to what it would be at sea level, sea level equivalent pressure. Um, there's a very, very rough rule of thumb. It's about an inch of mercury or about 33 or four millibars for every thousand feet. 
if I go up a thousand foot mountain or up in a thousand feet up in a balloon or whatever like that, the pressure is going to drop by about an inch of mercury or about 30 something um, millibars just because the altitude. So they always adjust to sea level for fair comparisons. Um, now, by the way, pilots actually, airplanes, you know, can use, oh, uh, Aldrich, you'd be interested in this, your altimeter. Uh, the altimeter uh, is basically a barometer, but it's used to tell your altitude. But you got to worry about the altimeter setting because you don't want, just like we don't want the weather map messed up by altitude differences, we don't want altitude measurements messed up by weather differences, which means you crash your little plane because, you know, you thought you were up high and you weren't because you ran, flew into a region of low pressure. If you flew into a region of low pressure, you might think, wow, I must be up really high because the pressure is low. But no, maybe the pressure is low because the pressure is low. You know, then you're not really up high. So, so pilots have to worry about such things. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to explain probably the hardest thing we have to understand. I don't know. There's a couple of hard things in this chapter. I'm going to do my best to get across to you why pressures vary from place to place. So, first of all, I wouldn't blame you. In fact, I'd be kind of impressed if you were to say PV equals NRT. When I said that temperatures, you know, make pressures vary, I, I, yay, if you came up with that. It's, it's a wonderful, true thing. The ideal gas law. You know. It would appear from the ideal gas law that raising the temperature would raise the pressure. It would appear to. As long as you keep N constant, but that is a constant, that's the gas constant. Um, and you keep no, sorry, sorry, sorry. N is the number of moles. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is the gas constant. R is, and it's constant. Maybe you have a fixed number of moles of gas. And yeah, and what about the volume? You know what? P is proportional to T if the volume is held constant. But the thing that blows this open is the volume is not constant. When air is heated, it's not trapped in a can. And since it's not trapped in a can, that means this is not going to be particularly helpful. Sorry, it was a wonderful thought, but it ain't going to help us a whole lot here. Instead, I'm going to try to make sense of it. Here's how it goes. Instead of drawing a weather map looking down at the isobars, I'm going to say, like, this is land down here, and this is one place, and this is another place, and this is up high, this is down low. This is the ground. I mean, you get the idea. You know, there's clouds somewhere. It's a you know slice of the atmosphere looking from the side. Okay, I'm going to draw some isobars that don't represent differences in pressure in different geographic locations, but instead represent the very obvious drop in pressure as you go up. Maybe there's a thousand millibars right here, and then 900 here. And then it kind of spreads out, 800 up here, maybe 700s up there. I'm simply saying that pressure decreases as you go up, and it decreases at a decreasing rate every time you go up a certain amount because there's less on top of you, you squeeze it, and it gets less dense. But watch what happens if I apply heat to one location. Let's make this place hot. When we make this place hot, kind of obviously, air tries to expand. I think you know this. Uh, sometimes you, you take a balloon and it's been out in the cold and you bring it inside the warm house, it gets bigger. Uh, maybe you know that heating things makes them want to like explode or, or whatever, or, you know, it builds up pressure. Of course it does. When you raise the temperature, it means you're making the molecules faster. They go faster, and they push on things harder. They try to push things out of their way. You know that. So it's natural for a gas to try to expand when you heat it. How do I show the air that gets heated by this hot ground expanding? Well, if it expands, realize that each of these lines, 1,900, whatever, is kind of an indication of how much air lies above it. This 1,000 millibars is 1,000 because of 
that much air laying on top of it. And there's whatever amount of air laying on top of this too. It's stacked up. If I heat it, here's what's going to happen. It's going to expand. In fact, what I want to do is I want to heat this side and leave this side relatively cold. So what will happen is the air is going to puff up and expand over the hot place. Hopefully that makes sense to you so far. Um, that means if I were up at, say, this level up here, I would actually be able to breathe better here than over here. Because here, the air is all puffed up nice and tall, and there's like extra air up here, and I'm under a decent amount of pressure considering my altitude. So in a way, this has become, now I said high for up high, that's what I meant by that, H, but actually, it's actually relatively high pressure over here considering the altitude, because if this is 700 here, that's 800, the pressure is probably, it's like about maybe 760, but over here, um, maybe at this point over here, maybe it's only in terms of millibars, I don't know, maybe it's 670 or something like that. So for a given altitude, here's high pressure, here's low pressure. There's something else that ought to be kind of obvious. If something's pushing harder this way on some chunk of air, an air parcel, remember parcels? Pass the parcel, man, remember? Um, if if something's pushing harder this way than something is pushing this way, who wins? The one pushing this way wins. And so air would naturally flow outward away that way. It would fly, maybe it's east or something. Air would tend to flow out that way. That means there would be a net loss of air molecules over this person. As the air moves away, of course, it kind of takes the isobars with it. I should have got another color. I don't have my markers out for it. I can see them right now, do I? They're in some box under the computer, I guess. I'll keep using this one, I guess. Um, just look closely. So, so what will happen is, as air moves out under pressure um, from here, these isobars are going to lower down here, but they're going to rise up here. Kind of like, I'll draw them dash, jump out. They're going to, they're going to lower down here and rise up there. Lower down here and rise up there. This simply shows what um, air spilling from this mountain of tall air over this valley of low air. You might imagine a big pile of sand. And when sand spills off of the hill, uh, uh, you know, oh, here's a person at the beach buried under a pile of sand. I mean, they got an air hole to breathe with. I don't know what I mean. And here's another person buried over here, except this person's barely buried. They're not under much sand. And if this sand pile collapses and goes out over this person, now this person's under more sand than they were, and this person's under less sand than they were. That's kind of weird. Um, in any case, Notice that we've actually moved air off from on top of this person, and now it's on top of this person. This person now has more air on top of them than they did because it spilled off of the big pile of heated air over here. That means that at the surface, we have high pressure. And over here, with air having left and not being on top of it anymore, we have relatively low pressure. We do still have kind of high-ish pressure considering the altitude over here and kind of low-ish pressure considering the altitude over here, but we've kind of evened things out a little bit in terms of the, um, the isobars. And now we have more pressure over the ground here than we have over here. I know that was kind of a lot to, to think about, but here it is one more time. If you heat the air over this area here, it's colder here, colder here. If you heat this air, this air will puff up tall and then spill off onto the cold places 
leaving more air on top of the cold places, so they're under higher pressure, and less air here. If you didn't get that, play it again. You know, you get to do that with videos. So, having, having now talked about uh, what causes the pressure differences, temperature differences, and in case you didn't get it, hot places are going to tend to get lower surface pressures than cold places, because the air is going to spill off of the hot places and go to the cold places and make the higher, higher pressure of the cold places. Um, this is a general rule. There's more to it in some ways. All right, so what does that do? The answer, it makes the wind blow. It also makes rain versus clouds. How does that work? First of all, I'm now going to show a different picture. I'm not looking at a side view of the atmosphere anymore. I now want to look down on a map. In fact, I'll even, you know, what the heck, I'll put, you know, Georgia on the map. On my mind, it's on the map. There's Georgia, South Carolina, you know, North Carolina. I'll get a few more states in. There's Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, you know, all that, all that stuff. Um, what if there is high pressure over Mississippi for whatever reason? Maybe it's because it's cold or something, but it's, it's high pressure over Mississippi. And there's low pressure over South Carolina. And we're in between. I'm going to draw some isobars. Gosh, I really could use those markers. Just taking them out. Okay. Um, get a marker. Give me a sec here. I could show you the dog. Marker, marker, marker. Marker. Multicolored markers. Coming back. We're back. Okay. Here are some isobars. Maybe this one says a thousand and twenty, and this one says a thousand and sixteen, and this one says a thousand and twelve, and this one says a thousand and eight. This is high pressure, this is low pressure. Now I want you to consider a parcel so we can play past the parcel. Here is an air parcel, it's a chunk of air. It doesn't actually have visible borders, you know, we talked about this. It's just an imaginary chunk of air. And it's under pressure from both sides, from both directions. On this side, it's being pushed on with a pressure, let's say, of 1,020 millibars. This side of our pretty big chunk of air is being pushed on with a pressure of only, I don't know, I'd say about 1,018 millibars. So who wins? 1,020 wins. There's a difference of two millibars between this side and this side of the parcel. Now, I could talk about this thing called the pressure gradient. It's the change in pressure with location. So, for example, if this were 100 miles, 50 miles, if that's 50 miles and there's a two millibar difference over 50 miles in the pressure gradient, is 2 divided by 50, you know, 0.04, whatever, millibars per mile, 0.04, I think, or something. Uh, in any case, that causes something called the PGF. Can you figure out what PGF stands for? Pressure gradient force. It's the net force on this thing. So here is the PGF pointing this way. It is entirely obvious, I think, what the PGF tries to make the air do. It tries to make you go to South Carolina. And in fact, in a perfect world, eh, how about a non-rotating, frictionless world? If there were no other forces, it is obvious what would happen. The air would go straight from high to low pressure. In fact, to be more specific, it would cut directly across isobars. For example, if the isobar had some curve to it like that, you'd have the wind blowing towards the low pressure perpendicularly across the isobars due to the 
pressure gradient force. That would be easy. Wind would just blow from high pressure to low pressure. But you know we can't make it that easy, right? There's the problem. The Earth is spinning. And that kind of puts a twist on everything. And the twist is famous. The twist is called the Coriolis force. Or better, it's called the Coriolis effect because it's not exactly a force. It looks like a force. It does things like a force because it's a frame of reference issue. I'm going to try to explain this to you. It would be better, you know, if we had the whole classroom and I could throw a ball to you and stuff. So you have to use your imagination a little bit. Let's suppose... I throw a ball to you. There you are. Here am I. And I throw it and it goes straight to you. That's easy. But what if one of us is moving? What if you're moving this way when I throw the ball towards you? Then in your world, the ball will seem to go at an angle. It'll seem to cut off to one side. Um, it's so obvious if you know you're the one moving because you're like a uh, a receiver playing football, and you're supposed to catch a pass. I mean, it's kind of obvious if the quarterback throws the pass right at you and you run away from where it's going, you're going to miss it. In your world, though, it'll look like some mysterious force pushed the ball off to the side. No, it didn't really. It was just doing its thing, but it looked like that. Let's complicate things a little bit more. What if the quarterback who throws the ball is the one running? If I'm running and I try to throw a ball to you, and I throw it right where I see you, the ball's going to get out in front of you because it possesses my component of motion in that direction, and you'd also miss it. Step it up one more thing. What if the quarterback and the receiver are both running in the same direction at the same speed? That kind of fixes things. If we're both running the same direction at the same speed, I just throw the ball straight at where I see you, and it does possess my you know, component of motion in that direction, but you've got that component too, and you'll see the ball go straight to you in your world. But any difference in those two speeds is going to show up. Now, instead of me being a quarterback throwing a football to you, you know, trying to catch it, uh, let's just stand in different parts of the earth. Let's say I'm standing yeah, in Georgia, and the earth is rotating like this. So I'm a running thrower I'm moving towards the east. Actually, I'm moving about, it's close to 900 miles per hour. Let's call it 900 around off a little bit. So I'm moving 900 miles an hour toward the east. But I'm throwing it to you, and maybe you live down near the equator. Since the earth is bigger around the equator than it is at higher latitudes, bigger around in this direction, you're going faster than me. You're going to kind of outrun me. And the ball I throw to you, while it possesses an eastward component to its motion, I'm throwing it south. I'm trying to throw it south. I think I'm throwing it south. In my world, I'm throwing it south. But it possesses an eastward component of, say, 900 miles per hour because of how fast the Earth is spinning where I am. But you possess a horizontal speed of 1,100, no, sorry, 1,000, 1,000 miles an hour. That means compared to you, the ball I threw, by the time it gets to you, you're going to discover it has a component relative to you of 100 miles per hour towards the west. And the way it'll look to me and to you, if I'm looking at you, if I can see you somehow, is it will appear to have been forced off to the west. It will appear to have been forced off this way. It'll really just be because... You, down at the equator, were going faster than I was, but it'll make it look like it got forced off toward the west. Um, and the direction west, when I'm facing south, is to my right. If you threw it to me, your 1,000 miles per hour would be faster than my 900, and it would get out ahead of me, and it would be curved towards the east but that's still towards its right as it faces, as it travels, and balls have faces on the middle where they're going or something. So, um, in other words, in the northern hemisphere, every time you throw a ball to somebody, it appears to be deflected towards its right. In the southern hemisphere, you can think the argument through. Further south you are, the slower you're going. 
you throw a ball, it's going to appear to get deflected towards its left. Now, this effect is greater and greater at higher latitudes. It also is greater, when it seems to be a force, at greater speeds. I'm not going to worry with the formula for it. I think there might be a little box or appendix in the books with it, in the book with it. It's called the Coriolis effect. And the Coriolis effect is going to change what's going on here. I'm going to go a couple more minutes and we're at 30 right now. I'll go about another five. Um, so here's the deal. So this air parcel starts moving to the right. Um, and then it's going to get deflected. Uh, well, to the east. It's going to get deflected towards the south because of the Coriolis effect. I'll draw the Coriolis effect like a vector. I'll, I'll, first of all, I'll make the parcel have already moved some. It's already moved some because it got started by the pressure gradient. And now the pressure gradient's still there. That didn't change early. Not much, probably. Still got pressure gradient force on it. But now, lo and behold, it's got the Coriolis effect acting on it that knocks it off course towards the south, towards its right, is it with its whole face going that way, goes. So it's going to get bent off toward the south. In fact, the Coriolis effect always knocks you perpendicularly off your velocity that you're going. You know, it's always knocking you sideways. If, if we had class, I'd take you out on the field, I'm sorry, and I'd let somebody be an air parcel, and I'd let somebody be the pressure gradient force, and somebody could be the Coriolis effect, and push people around and watch what happens. It's actually a pretty good demo. It really helps. But in any case, do the best we can. So it's going to get knocked off course. Now, theoretically, here's what should ultimately, well, I'll just draw it on here. Here's what should happen. Eventually, the parcel will get knocked off course so much that it will find itself in this situation. The pressure gradient will be pointing one direction, and the Coriolis effect will be pointing the opposite direction, and the velocity will point this way. And you'll actually find the thing moving along the isobars. That's weird because it should have moved across the isobars. But the uh, Coriolis can just get its hands in the situation, mess it up. And so you end up with the weird fact that air would be moving along isobars, and in such a way that if you stand here, this is your nose, and these are your ears, and these are your eyes. If you stand here with the wind blowing in your face, here's your hands. This is your left hand, and this is your right hand. You'd actually be able to stand out in the wind and declare that with your face into the wind, blowing in your face, that high pressure is on your left and low pressure is on your right. Yeah. This is called the geostrophic wind. The geostrophic wind is what happens when the pressure gradient force, when the PGF and the Coriolis effect balance each other and leave you with this situation. The air doesn't stop. It keeps moving. Newton's first law is... For some of the forces is zero, so it keeps doing what it's doing. That's physics, you know. It's kind of why this physics is a pre or prerequisite for this. You know what, though? I'm sorry. It doesn't stop there. There's another force. We have trees and buildings and bumps of various kinds, and even the ground itself brings friction into the picture. And when friction interferes, it always is in the opposite direction from the motion. If the wind is heading towards the east, then friction with the surface and things sticking up off the surface is going to push it the other way and try to slow it down. Here's the thing. If you slow down the motion of the air parcel, you reduce the Coriolis effect. Because the Coriolis effect, according to some equation that I'm not teaching you, is um, proportional to the speed. So slowing the air down friction reduces the Coriolis effect. If you reduce the Coriolis effect, it has less power to knock the original thing off course. And it establishes a new equilibrium, and I'll draw it. You end up with this. I'll make the picture a little clearer. Here are some isobars. Here's our air parcel. 
and we will have the pressure gradient trying to do what it always did. But the air will be moving this direction, that's the velocity, and we're going to have the Coriolis effect perpendicular to the velocity and friction opposite direction from the velocity. And these three forces eventually are going to work out a deal. They're going to work out a deal where they add up as vectors to zero. And when the net force on it is zero, as you should learn in physics, that means the velocity is going to settle down and stay what it is. So that means the air is ultimately going to blow in this direction. It's going to kind of do its original thing where it was going to try to go from high to low. That's what it wanted to do. And it's going to kind of do the Coriolis thing where you get knocked off course like that. But it's going to reach a compromise because friction gets in the mix. And it's going to go at an angle. This angle depends on how much friction there is. If there's very little friction because you're over open water, then the velocity might be kind of like this, almost parallel to the isobars. If there's lots of friction, like mountains and big trees and stuff and buildings, then it's probably going to be more across the isobars. And uh, that's the way the wind really blows. And the last thing I'll say is, if you're way up high in the atmosphere, there's not much friction up there. There's no, nothing much to rub against. So high in the atmosphere, the wind tends to be pretty much geostrophic. This was a long one. Watch it in pieces or whatever. And I will take another video or two to get through chapter six. I will post the assigned problems uh, tomorrow. Right now, you just hold it. I mean, oh, I'll post them on Thursday, I guess, something. Anyway, see you later. Bye.